Nature Breakthroughs with Dr. Wild Ben Goldman. Conversations with changemakers in a world gone mad. To discover what you need for personal, organizational, and societal change, get your free download of Three Ancient Rituals Smart Entrepreneurs Use to Bounce Back from Shifts in the Market and Inside Themselves. Go to www.naturebreakthroughs.com. Yes, you pull them, yes, you pull them till they bite down On the lies that you build from my doubts I don't want money, I don't want cars I just want to be free So, welcome, Marie DeVoe Is that how you pronounce your last name? It is, yes, DeVoe I know it's French, so there's extra letters for no apparent reason Is your, uh, your family background is French? No, actually, the name itself uh, My father is from the Bahamas and there's a street in downtown Nassau called DeVoe Street. And so it's, everyone in my family will tell you it's a very Bahamian name. Um, but as far as I know, we're, we're not French. Interesting. Um, yeah. And so you're the founder of High Tides Consulting, right? Yes, that's right. High Tides Consulting. We do coaching and consulting for um, leaders who are looking to be more inclusive. All right. So welcome to Nature Breakthroughs, conversations with change makers in a world gone mad. And, yeah. And what's the change you're trying to make in the world? Yeah. So I primarily focus on inclusive leadership and how we can bring uh, more nurturing environments to our workspaces. And so I work with a lot of women of color who are transitioning from otherwise toxic work environments to really stepping into creating businesses that are nurturing, that are loving, that really support and um, validate who they are in their full identity. And then I also teach workshops in corporate spaces to help them create those spaces where everyone does feel welcome in their work and supported. So like, what's the, what's the, if there was one, is there a key to this? Well, a key is work shouldn't feel like work. <laughs> what should it feel like? It should feel like fun. It should feel like play. It should feel like a big hug. And I think a lot of times that's not how people experience their work. You know, as someone who's been an executive and it's someone who has been accused of being toxic as an executive, mm, mm -hmm. I can remember the days when, I, I, I mean, it, you know, the, there are so many like deliverables or, or responsibilities that I would have, you know, to make, to just to pay my staff, to be able to pay them and you know, the idea, I can remember many times when the idea of having fun just wasn't going to, it just wasn't on top of my mind because I was worried that I'd have to lay them off or <laughs> that kind of thing. Right. But it's, but it's so true. I mean, we come very much accustomed to like the busyness of work and this idea that we have to be constantly going. Or even if we think about kind of the American corporate machine, a lot of it is built around this idea of like grinding and working to exhaustion. And we glorify very long work days or work weeks and then come to find out that's actually not really good for us as human beings. Right? So, so there has to be a happy medium where the work that we do doesn't cost us our, our lives. Right. Uh, and so I really like to think that, you know, as people are thinking about how they're showing up at work, their experience of work, there is definitely room for us to experience work differently, right? Where it doesn't have to be stressful in that way that you've described, where it's, you know, this constant worry um, about the worst case scenario always at our back. And you have uh, like a success story? I mean, I have a million questions like, yeah, like doesn't that require changing the nature of our economy? Like, it's, isn't it just like, isn't it not just about culture and, and leadership, but you know, it's about economics. And then, and then all of a sudden things get so complicated as I think about it. So do you have a, an example of success story? So, you, okay, you... so good example. So one of my, one of my favorite clients um, was a, a adjunct professor at an Ivy League school. And she worked very hard to get to that position and was working, you know, the nature of higher ed, you work kind of this hodgepodge mix of things to craft together enough to, to pay your bills. And adjunct professors, they don't make a, a ton of money, right? So she's working all of this time, um, doing what she's been training her whole life to do. And then in her free time, in her spare time, she was teaching these equity education workshops for large school districts. And when I met her, she told me, you know, the problem that she's having is there just wasn't enough time for her to continue the work she was doing as an adjunct 
and build this amazing company that was really a public service that she was doing. And so we talked about what were the things that were holding her back. And it was all the things that you mentioned. Oh, well, I, the financial piece, how am I going to, I have like this steady income, right? And I steady, right? <laughs> steady income coming in from the university. And I, I have to hold on to that in order to do this thing. And at the same time, that was coming into conflict with her time commitments to, to get it all done, right? And so what we did was we started looking at, well, one, how can we reframe how you're thinking about your finances, right? And then two, looking at what would it look like to reprioritize how you're leveraging your time and investing your time. Because honestly, all of the time that she was spending as an adjunct, we actually just took that time, poured that into what she was creating in her business, right? The work that she loved. And suddenly that was creating the financial stability that she thought she was going to miss out on, right? So it's just, it's quite a bit of a reframe for people to think about what else is possible. I think a lot of people come to their work and come to really any type of salaried work. But that's, that's just an assumption that we've made. And so if we start to reimagine what work could be. Say the assumption again, we froze for a second. Oh yeah. So the assumption that we make is that um, being hired as an employee, having a salaried position is the only way for us to sustain ourselves financially, right? That, that is the assumption that we, we tend to make and that without that, we're going to somehow be financially destitute, right? There's no security in any other option. But if we start to reimagine how we're investing our time, right? We start to also reimagine how we're creating sustenance for ourselves. So it's really a reallocation of resources and the primary resource is always ourselves, right? Like if you don't exist, the work doesn't happen anyway. So, so it's really about thinking, how can you invest yourself in, in new ways so that it's actually nurturing as opposed to investing yourself in something that might be a toxic work environment that maybe you're not feeling fully appreciated where you don't have psychological safety when you come into work, where you're feeling in a number of ways oppressed by the very environment that you're saying you need in order to survive. Right. And so it, it really is just rethinking about what we're considering our source. So in that, I mean, you, you've heard the, I mean, this is, it has such a sexist title, but the rich dad, poor dad. Uh, mm -hmm. mom. Yeah, Robert Kiyosaki, yeah. Yeah, as opposed to rich mom, poor mom, but, or rich, whatever, poor person, mm -hmm. person, but how, how, so it's, it's, you know, the idea that the job is the kind of least efficient, least, has the least promise of the four quadrants yeah. or how, of making money where, you know, the job is, is you know, it's, you're selling your, your time. And then if you become an independent, a self, you know, self-employed, self mm -hmm. you, you're still selling your time, but you're, you're selling it back to yourself. You're not selling it to somebody. I mean, you're in control, more in control, but it's still selling your time. And then if you own your own business where you, you're, you're able to hire people, that gives you more time and more, more leverage. And then, if, then you know, the greatest leverage is to, to just invest in other people. And I, I don't, is that part of what you're talking about or? Well, I think tangentially, I think even in that framework, we're still limited by, you know, largely like capitalism being the only way to do it. <laughs> exactly. Right. So yeah. again, like there's, a, there's an assumption in there already, but I think to a large extent, the idea of really kind of the highest you can get on that food chain is investing in other people, I think stands true. But I would also attest that the most important person for you to invest in is going to be yourself. And, and it's not really investing in other people it, because of the system. It's investing in corporate structure. I mean, in the, in enti in corporate entities. Right. I don't, right. Know, so it's, it's people, but it's people organized in legal, in legal entities, you know, mm -hmm. at, in companies. Yeah. But even that, even, I mean, even that idea is, is kind of interesting because you know, in the United States, you form a, a company and it becomes an entity. It's like a person, right? Which in a lot of ways is problematic, <laughs> right? Because a company actually is not a person. A, a company is a, is a company. And I think one of the, the things that really struck me when I was working in the corporate arena was that I thought human resources was the place that really cared and nurtured people. And then I very quickly found out that human resources was the legal entity that protected the company from the people which is a very interesting distinction, <laughs> right? And so when you think about, well, what happens to the needs of the people, they do kind of fall pretty far down the list of priorities because now everything is in service of this new entity, the company, right? And so even in that, I think that's an important lesson for people to really think about 
when you are working for someone else, working for this other entity, that's not an actual person who can care for you and nurture you. That is still now always your responsibility. So you can't get lost right in the company, which is inevitably what happens. I mean, a lot of my clients are coming from corporate work environments where they've been working very long for very hard and they're essentially now at burnout and wondering, is this all there is? And it's largely because they've forgotten that it's their job to take care of themselves. And so did your, did you go through that transition of working in a, in HR for corporations and decided to break out on your own? I mean, so you, you're specializing, is, are, is High Tides Consulting specializing in helping people move from that kind of corporate situation to a entrepreneurial situation? And, and so the question is, if so, did you go through that own, your, yourself? Yeah. So, I mean, the short answer, my, my company started from my own experience. I was working in training and development. I worked in operations for over a decade and then training and development. So teaching managers how to lead, right? Creating systems and training and supports for creating new leaders within an organization. And as I was working there, I also found myself because of that type of role, I was leading a lot of workshops. I was doing a lot of coaching and the aspects of that role that I really liked the best were the coaching and actually watching people come into this new awareness around who they were being and how they were showing up as leaders, right? That just lights me up. And at the time I was working at one particular role, uh, I was like four years in, had built a training department from scratch. They didn't have anything when I showed up. So I spent all of this time and energy there and was working those ridiculous hours, right? You know, 60, 70 hour weeks. At one point I had to completely rearrange my schedule. So I was coming into the office at 7 a.m. back when, you know, the world was open and we went into an office to leaving to go pick up my children, do dinner, bath time, homework, bedtime, and then getting back online at nine, 10 o'clock at night and then working till three o'clock in the morning, right? That was my cycle. And it came to a point where I started grinding my teeth. I was bringing a lot of stress home to my spouse, to my partner, right? Things were really like literally the signs of everything falling apart, a very visible burnout was occurring for me. And I remember venting to my sister one day, on the phone and I had come into the office 7 a.m. No one's in the office. I go into a conference room and I'm telling my sister, I'm like, I don't think I'm gonna make it here. I don't think I can do this much longer. I gotta get out. And my sister says to me, and you know, speaking about this idea of like, no, you need the job security, you need this paycheck. My sister told me, well, just stay until they pay you your bonus because you worked really hard. You could at least, you know, pay out your bonus. So I said, okay, fine, I'll try and, and hang on for that. It was like, I think seven weeks till bonuses were gonna pay out. I already knew what I was gonna get, right? Best performance review of my life, because I mean, if you're working that hard, they gotta say something. And that same day, I get calls into the office of my manager and she tells me that she had heard me that morning, had listened to my entire phone conversation, right? So essentially had sat in the next room, eavesdropped on the entire private conversation at 7 a.m. and that we had to do something about it. Now. People who know me know I'm a very direct communicator. I'm very transparent in, in things that are working and not working. So everything I had told my sister about management not working and how I felt, I had already shared with this manager. And so I didn't think anything of it. I said to her, well, you know, you already know that we don't have a really good working relationship. Communication breakdowns keep happening. And, you know, you let me know how you want to move forward, but I don't, I don't really see how this changes anything. We have a lot of work to do. And then that Monday, I got called into a new meeting now with that manager and with the executive director and CEO of the company. And the CEO sits me down and tells me that I know nothing about anything. I should feel lucky that, that I work there. I'm fortunate to be working with this manager. And then the manager turns to me and says, you know, I don't even know what you do here. So they tell me that I have six weeks to prove myself after four years of busting my butt and building a department. I have six weeks now to prove myself and then they're going to determine what's going to happen. And, and it's seven weeks to the bonus. Seven weeks till bonus. They give me six weeks, right? So this, this in corporate land, we call this a performance intervention plan, right? Which is essentially a, an HR tool to fire you, right? In hopes of you not suing them <laughs> is what it is. And so in that six weeks, what happens is they disband my entire department. Everyone now reports to somebody else. They, they retroactively changed my performance review, right? So I had straight fives across the board. They go, they alter all of the numbers. It gets to the point where I show up for meetings and people stop looking me in the eye. So if you can just imagine, right, working in that type of a space where literally it feels as though you are invisible, 
even though you're working so hard that now you're, you're doing harm to your physical body, right? So in that same six weeks, I go ahead, I incorporate my side hustle. I, you know, go ahead and turn that into an LLC. I start working with clients. I build up and develop my website. And exactly six weeks to the day when they do fire me, that afternoon I get on a plane, I, I go to San Francisco because I have to teach the next day for Facebook. And that was one of 48 speaking engagements that I, I did the year I transitioned into my business. Amazing. You're, you're amazing. <laughs> but it's, but I, I tell people it's, but it's not special. I'm not the only person who's been in that environment where you're, you're looking at your job. Like, I can't believe this is what. Well, it's, what's day. partly amazing to me is, is that you, there was not even a rebound there. You just moved from one thing to the next. It didn't knock you on your, on your, on your butt. It sounds like, uh, I mean, that didn't even, you didn't even take a break or a breath. Like when I think of my last situations, can I, can I share? share yeah, please. Mind? I'd love to hear. Uh, I was, I was running. I mean, I've run a lot of different kinds of organizations. Last one was a nonprofit organization. It was mm -hmm. an arts organization in Newark, New Jersey. Okay. The oldest contemporary art space in New Jersey. And I did amazing work there. I, I the, the former executive and his lieutenant were assaulted by a hammer wielding lunatic and the and the place was basically about to go under and they hired me and I I all the programs grew five to tenfold. Mm -hmm. I served so many more youth and artists and I mean we did so many innovative things. We started a, a massive mural program in, in in Newark. You know, we we I, I, I did a lot of work for Cory Booker who was the mayor mm -hmm. at the time with Cory Booker and you know, he went on, of course, to become a senator. And mm -hmm. so there was just tons and tons of success. And it was me working in a really f dangerous neighborhood, dangerous corner. I mean, I, in the six years I worked there, I think three people were murdered on my corn on the corner. Wow. I mean, I'm talking, you know, this was serious, you know, urban, inner city, whatever you want to call it. You know, and the Dodge Foundation called us to anchor to the redevelopment of the community. And but I was having... I have no training in HR <laughs> and I was having the hardest time recruiting talent and you know I had very little money even though I had grown it a lot it was still a tiny organization relatively speaking I mean it was under a million dollar a year budget and and I was determined to attract a people of color to staff the organization in a neighborhood of co of color and and I look the way I look and so there was you know there was so there was it's like when everyone's hungry and the pie is limited no matter how many like cherries you give to other people no matter what you do there's so much it's it it's like a, it was like a pressure cooker and I hired a young African-American woman who was under you know under trained but I kind of, I guess, always figured people were like me. They would just learn what they needed to learn and, and, and get the job done. And she needed more help uh, than I could give her, basically. And so what I did was I teamed her up with a board member who was also an African-American woman. And I thought that, you froze for a second. I teamed her up with an African-American uh, wo board woman who was a board member to, mm -hmm. to mentor her. And... Meanwhile, I, I had an executive coach who had been telling me for three years I needed to leave, that this was never going to work, no matter how hard I, no matter what we accomplished and all the great things we did, that this was burning me out and was going to like kill me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I had pneumonia from working so hard and, you know, all kind, anyway, I'm going on and on. What basically happened was she, the two of them started an investigation of me got the board to begin to investigate me. Mm -hmm. And so all I, all I knew, and it was the kind of thing, you know, like the, the, the boy, little Dutch boy putting, putting his fingers in the, in the, diet, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. to, and so I would be, I would be, you know, creating this program, you know, so as an executive, you got to manage a board and you got to manage your staff and you got to manage your programs and you got to go fundraise and you got to do all these different things. Mm -hmm. So, so I took my eye. So I, I had actually, slowly develop create, create put i had slowly uh professional well i had slowly what do you call it what's the word 
when you cultivated the board, you know, like I, I, I gave them training and I, mm -hmm. I had rotated everyone out and got it all professionalized so that there was an actual rotation. It wasn't the same people on the board for a hundred years. And there was all, all new board members or mostly all new board members that I had found, you know, so they, so they were all my board members, but I, I left them alone for a couple of months because I was so busy doing all this stuff. And I, I was noticing that they were not helping. They were not mm. helping me fundraise. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, what I didn't realize is that was because they were spending the whole time investigating me. Oh, and, wow. Yeah. And so they, they finally confronted me out of the blue, you know, with this, with this fact. And, you know, my mouth uh, dropped and I was like, you mean this is what you've been doing instead of ra raising money? And uh, well, so I don't know why I'm going on and on, but oh, just that, that it, it affected me much more than it did you. I didn't just pick pick my I could I didn't rotate into the next thing immediately afterwards. It really knocked me uh, knocked me down. And mm -hmm. I remember saying to the board chair, maybe it's time for us to talk about uh, transition. Mm -hmm, he mm -hmm. his eyes open because he he was one of the remaining board members that had been there for a hundred years, and I thought he I think he thought I was going to talk about him leaving the board, and uh, so when he realized I meant that I wanted to leave that I was we're talking about my transition yeah but I also don't think he he want I don't think they wanted me to leave I don't think they even knew what they wanted but anyway that's what happened I left and then I ch I completely changed my life to doing this self-development work, but it, it, that was too long of a story, but I'm just impressed at how you just went from one thing to the next and it kept going. Whereas with me, it made me question my whole existence and what I was doing and yeah. who I was. And... Well, I think a lot of that is, was still happening for me internally. And I think what's interesting, even in, in hearing your story, you said you were working with an executive coach who was telling you for however long, like you gotta get out of here. This isn't, this isn't the place. And I think for all of us, when we find ourselves in situations we're not meant to be, there are signs that we see far before the, the event occurs, right? When I, you know, that six weeks when they decided to put me on a, an, an intervention plan, like I already knew that I wanted to leave. I was already plotting and already been saving my, you know, my reserve, you know, money to try and figure out how can I disentangle myself from this situation. But even that, I think, was delayed when I think about how long I'd been suffering from grinding my teeth at night, how long I was bringing stress. Like there are signs, right? And yeah. I think for a lot of us, we're just so willing for so long to ignore. The so I think, think for a, a lot of us, it's not that I like bounced back necessarily, but I wasn't surprised. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, I can remember sitting in the room when we, the board members went around telling me, you know, I guess it was like a 360 review or something, but I mean, I'm sure you were in that situation during those six weeks where you, you're just like, uh, my blood was boiling. I mean, I couldn't believe they were saying the things that they were saying to me. Did you, do you know what I'm saying? Did you have that kind of? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it got to the point where people, I mean, people would say the most ridiculous things, right? I mean, I remember I sat in one meeting where, and at the time that I was leaving, I was working in education. So the, the last project that I had at this particular job was I was facilitating a learning event for about 3,000 educators, which takes an extensive amount of logistical planning. And so I had mapped out all of the plans and what needed to happen, all of the different presenters and the instructors who were gonna be teaching. All, it's, I mean, it was like planning a conference. And I remember sitting in a meeting and watching as they took all of my plans and assigned them to someone else to deliver and then told everyone in the room that I was no longer in charge, right? And I remember walking out of that meeting and it was me and the last two remaining members of my team and we're going down in the elevator. And one of my, then at the time, he used to be my direct report, he'd since been reassigned. And he looks at me and he says, everyone knows what you did here and what happened in there doesn't matter. So there comes a time when it's, it's almost palpable yeah. how much people don't want you in the space anymore. Yeah. Right, and if you're not careful, you forget that you're valuable. Well, it requires right. so much mindfulness to just experience that, to go through that yeah. without leave, walking out of the room or, you know, right. reacting in some way. I mean, you sound, you must have had, you must either be naturally 
very composed, which I bet you are, but you must have also done, I mean, how, how did you, how were you able to, to, to handle all that? What, what was your, what was your, do you have certain, is this part of what you, is, I mean, one of the questions I want to ask you earlier is how do you create a leader? I mean, how, mm-hmm. how did you develop the leadership skill to kind of walk through that kind of war zone, battle without getting injured? Yeah. Well, it's interesting because again, I don't think it was without being injured. I think to your point of just, maybe I just have like a better poker face because I was only, you know, I would walk out of a meeting and then have to go outside to like the pier so I could cry. But I knew I, I couldn't do that inside the office. Right. So, but I think a lot of it, when I think of, you know, where do you start to learn to be a leader? I mean, I was, I was doing leadership, you know, training programs from the seventh grade where they were like, this is how you use a planner and you should run a club, you know? So I think a lot of those skills of just thinking about sometimes other people are going to be scared to do or say the things that you're willing to do. And that's fine. But in those moments, also recognizing and, and looking for places where I did feel affirmed and validated was extremely important for me. Even the day that I came into the office to talk to my sister, my sister all through my career was one of my, you know, personal board members. She was like my go-to person who would help me get some perspective. And just like you, you have an executive coach or someone who's able to look like bird's eye view and tell you like, Hey, look, look at this a little bit more objectively. So you're not taking all of that toxicity and ingesting it because it's very easy for all of us to forget like who we are in those moments when we're really being attacked. And so do you have a, a method for people who find themselves ready to jump? Oh, I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> it's one of my favorite things. And actually, it's, I mean, my, my, the framework that I use my, with my clients is called Me First. And it really is a way of remembering yourself in your work. And so we go through first knocking down all the money mindset barriers and garbage that people have told themselves around why they need to put up with toxic work environments. <laughs> and so the, the first part of the framework is really looking at your financial situation and really being intentional about what you're trying to create there and knocking down all of that stuff that tells you you need to rely on someone else for your own financial well-being. And then we look at some of the identity work and having people really explore who they are separate from their job. And this is really fascinating because I actually, I taught a workshop at a conference late last year, all HR leaders, all people who are trying to get more done with their budgets, they had to present in front of other members of their executive team. And I challenged them to think about who they were and what their personal mission and vision was. And the task was for them to introduce themselves to each other without stating their role. And they couldn't do it. And I've since found out and working with a lot of different, I've found that this is a very American thing, a very North American thing to introduce yourself and identify by your job. And I think that's something that we really have to be really careful about and mindful about because human beings are not their job. And so I do a lot of work with clients around who are you separate for your job? What do you personally stand for? What do you believe in separate from what your company says is important? right? And how do you stand for that? What does that mean for you? As a business owner, especially for people who are just starting out new businesses, I work with a lot of expert-based businesses, a lot of consultants, service-based businesses. So much of that work is so deeply personal. Your, your clients are buying you. They're not buying some large entity that we've pretended as a person. They are buying a real personal experience with you. And so if you're not clear on what you stand for and your values and who you are, separate from this job that you play, you're going to get lost all over again. We do a lot of work around identity. Um, and then I look at reinforcement and so building out some supports, networks, who are people who are going to play on your side, who's going to validate you, who's going to affirm you, who's going to be that personal board of directors. And then looking at self-care and time management, really energy management, so that you're not you know, really repeating that toxic cycle of work that you've become so accustomed to. I think a lot of folks, because we don't really see other models, we don't know how else we can exist. And so that whole process of like recreating that is kind of where I, I like to leave people in terms of what do you, what do you get to create outside of what work has been for you? And, and is are the people you work with mostly like part of like the kind of gig economy or part of the solopreneur world or are these people move, cha- moving into building, creating their own 
corporations and try not to replicate what they what they escaped. Yeah, well, it tends to be a mix. A lot of the a lot of the business owners I work with are just starting out, so they're like micro or very small businesses. So some of them are solopreneurs, some of them are like small agencies, right? So they might have a very small team of like five or six people who are, you know, full-time on payroll and then a myriad of people who are contracting for them. But these are folks who are really starting out and really stepping out to start to craft something that is largely built on what they believe and who they want to serve in the world. And are, and are they, are you involved with people that are having to deal with seed capital and angel investing and that whole aspect of, of entrepreneurship or not, not quite at that level? No, not typically. Most of, most of my clients, one, very, very small. So nowhere near that, that stage is yet in terms of thinking about looking for like venture capital and those kinds of things. And actually the majority of my clients are black and brown women. So they identify as, you know, a, a person of color and largely for those groups, those kind of opportunities just don't exist at that, the same level that we see and other spaces. So when we're talking about finances with my clients, we're usually looking at both personal finances and getting a grip and understanding on what they need to create there. What does sustainable mean for them? And then looking at from a business perspective, them putting together an operating budget and starting to think about funding sources. But mostly we're looking at grant funding. We're looking at ways to use crowdfunding and the power of community to build what they're, what they're creating. And I have spoken to um, a few venture capital coaches in the space as well to see what else is available. But I think the world of venture capital has a ways to go in terms of equity and inclusion as well for that to be a viable, a viable but, space for a lot of my so clients. It, so am I understanding you correctly that your sounds like a lot of your clients are, are actually starting nonprofit type organizations when you say grants? No. So most of my clients are starting for-profit organizations. When I'm talking about grants, I'm largely talking about small business grants and opportunities. Because I do serve a population that has largely been marginalized, there are a lot of opportunities for them to take advantage of in terms of government funding and seed money to get started as minority-owned businesses, as women-owned businesses. And so making sure people are taking advantage of those resources getting started as well. And that's its own complicated, that's its own complicated niche. Getting... It can be. It can be. Every, every state is going to be a little bit different in terms of what they require. There's also the federally funded programs. Right, so looking at ways that they can really leverage all of their municipalities and getting support around what they're creating. But again, most of them are, are starting so small, having them even think about what, what do they need in terms of operating capital is for some of them a huge hurdle. A lot of my clients have a lot of scarring from how they've related to money in the past, either from how they were raised to think about money. There tends to be a lot of scarcity mindset there, this feeling of there's never going to be enough. And then also just fear of confronting financial statements. Um, I can't tell you how many clients tell me, oh my gosh, I may have just spent three months getting you to actually let me look at and have the bravery to look at my financial statements and come up with a plan. So, and that's not to say that's everyone, but there's a lot of work to be done in terms of how people reframe their relationship with money. But these people you're working with must be very successful people to be able mm -hmm. to afford to hire you and to yeah. have their own businesses. And mm -hmm. so this is so everything you're saying is a very inside view, right? From the outside, they must look like they have it all together. And they're, they're, exactly. they're the successful ones from the, that they're the ones that are representing the success of, of the community and the, right? Yeah. For a lot of my clients, they have advanced degrees. It looks like they've done everything right. Yeah. Um, a lot of my clients, they're masters, JDs, PhDs. They've spent a lot of money on education and have been climbing, climbing, climbing. And now they're tired and there's a lot of guilt around them walking away from all of that. Usually because there's some expectations from their family, folks in, in this community who have spent a lot of time on their education, who now have good jobs, there oftentimes tends to be an expectation that they're going to help the rest of the family, right? But we also have to take into account, if you have three, four advanced degrees, you have an Im immense, immense amount of education debt behind you as well. And so when we talk then about, well, where does their money conversation come in? It gets to be very tenuous. And people have a lot of guilt about like, well, who am I to throw away this career, to throw away this education that my community supported me to get to go and do this thing that I love? Like they see it as very selfish. 
And so there's a lot of work to be done on like undoing some of that, you know? Can you, can you give me another success story of, of someone who did that and did, and like the last example you gave me, you said it so quickly, I couldn't even understand what it was. <laughs> you said something about equity, some kind of an equity thing. What, what, what is the success of a story of someone that left the corporate world and, and did something that they love that, that's working? Yeah, so another great example, one of my clients was in the uh, therapeutic setting and she was working at a community practice, right? So she's one of several counselors or therapists that people could see there. And she really wanted to step out and form her own private practice and really niche down in an area that she works on around resiliency and response to trauma. And- Is this um, a, like a psychologist? Or yes, yes. A PhD psychologist? Yes, yeah, a doctor, right, doctor. doctor. And but so not, she, a, not a psychiatrist, a, a PhD doctor. Yes, a PhD doctor. And so, and so she had this body of work that she's really passionate about. And working with her, there was a lot of money blocks, right? Because she had been largely working in community practice for such a long time. And people don't realize this, I think, about a lot of the health professions, right? Kind of the westernized health professions. But doctors spend a lot of money <laughs> on billing and on insurance and on the overhead of running a practice. And so she was actually making very little in terms of her take-home salary. And so when we talked about what it would be for her to transition and move over and start her private practice to do the work that she was invested in, she immediately had a lot of resistance and a lot of blocks. And she almost completely dropped out of my program. And she called me one day and she's like, I'm going through the finances section. And I just, I don't, I think I have to drop out of the program. I can't do this anymore. And she couldn't do it because she didn't like the finances or that the, or that when she looked at the numbers, it was bleak. It was bleak. It was too daunting. She was like, there's no way that I can do this. I don't see how I can do this. Me meaning you know? that the numbers didn't add up or that it was too, it, it's, or, or was it that her, you know, expertise is in psychology and it's not in financial management. So just, just having to face making all the calculations can be overwhelming for someone, even though if they were to make the calculation, they could see, oh my God, I'll make so much more money. Yeah. Uh, but they don't get to that point because it's just too many numbers. It's too it's, it's, Right. It's, it just, it was immediately like a red flag, like a huge resistance for her. And now of course, that's when, you know, as a coach, you're like, great, let's hop on a call. Let's talk about it. Right. Let's, let's look at what's going on for you. And she stayed in the program. She's actually now been a client of mine for over a year. And she had started her private practice and she's also received, you know, a small business grant, right? So it's, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. And we have to, there's always room to help people see like, Hey, this is a roadblock. You can actually move it, right? It doesn't have to stay here. But I think that's a good example of, you know, there are a lot of these kind of financial stories, these money stories that we tell ourselves that hinder us in other ways. Because from that place of thinking, well, I'm never going to be able to go into private practice, she would have changed nothing about her situation. But these are these are not just psychological blocks. I mean, just take the example that you're giving. I've had a fair amount of experience through family of dealing with that particular profession, for example, mm -hmm. and, you know, and you know, easily half and often more than half the staff at many of these community practices are in the billing and insurance department. And if you break away and work on your own, it doesn't eliminate the need for processing for, for that. Kind of, you know, that's how, that's how the system works. It's all paid right. for through, through insurance. And you have to, you have to figure out how to, I mean, being an entrepreneur is, and maybe I'm, maybe I need your coaching. It's so much more difficult than you can possibly imagine. I mean, it's like, it, it's, it's miraculous when in, ever anyone see, succeeds. I mean, mm -hmm. there's just so many roadblocks and, and so many complexities. And like, that's a, a good example, which is even, even if she overcomes the fear of doing the calculations, you know, that's a real management job to figure out how, how do I, get all, you know, either they don't take insurance, in which case it's like its own particular business model, or if they do, they have to hire, they have to hire out, they have to have a whole system set up to, right. to process all that stuff. Right. But that's, that's also too, where we get into, well, what support structures are you putting in place? Because especially for someone who's like a therapist, someone who's in, you know, solopreneur, who's independent practitioner, you have to have support, right? 
Um, I tell my clients, there are things you're going to start to learn about as you're running your business that you're not going to like, but that doesn't mean you have to do them forever. You have to understand them, right? At least to the point where you're able to delegate that to somebody else and you know what questions to ask that person. And so when I talk to people about, and they're, most of my clients, they come to me specifically because they hate the money stuff. <laughs> they hate the money. I'm like, great, let's get you to learn enough about it so we can hire you a bookkeeper and a distant, a great CPA. We can make sure that you hire someone to do your billing, right? Because just because you're an entrepreneur doesn't mean you're meant to do all the things. And so there's a lot of room when I talk about supports and not recreating those cycles of burnout, like stop trying to do all the things. You signed up for your business because there's like one thing you really love. And there's going to be a time where you're not going to have as much time to do that one thing, but we're always trying to get back to that, right? Which means you need an abundance of support and you have to learn how to ask for help. Yeah. Very wise. Yeah. Um, but, but you're right. There's a lot that goes into a business that a lot of people don't even realize. <laughs> well, and do you want to talk a little about the differences for women, for people of color? Like, I mean, I know as someone who's not a woman and who's not considered a person of color, how, and who has, is what they call a serial entrepreneur. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I've, I, I, I mean, it is so, I've seen every single, I don't know if it's every single one, but I've seen how things can fail in so many different ways <laughs> to add, if there's additional, if, I, if, if there are other things than what I went through, it's, it's just, are there and what are they? Because mm. If you are a woman or a person of color. Ah, yeah. So I think, so there's a, a couple of things. So largely women and specifically women of color are the fastest growing segment of entrepreneurs in the country, right? Known for starting businesses at a faster rate than anyone else. So why is that? First of all, and, and can I also ask the flip side of it is what are the advantages? Like mm -hmm. we don't have to be all negative here. There's probably yeah. some, some advantages too. Well, I think, so when we talk about entrepreneurship, right, and I, I love this question because even you immediately thought about uh, venture capital and startups and people who need seed funding. That is not the world that I live in, and it isn't the world that most of my clients live in. The reason that women of color entrepreneurs are the fastest growing segment in business ownership is most of those businesses stay micro, right? Most of those businesses are making less than $50,000 a year. Most of those businesses have a staff of one, right? And a lot of times women are starting these businesses in addition to running their households, in addition to supporting their families financially and otherwise. So m the kinds of businesses that I see in my community tend to be of the side hustle nature, right? People who have a gift or a talent, they start marketing those services or those products to people in their community. And they're not thinking that that's a viable way for them to live their life because they are doing all of these other responsibilities at the same time. One of the challenges with that, and for those businesses who do decide to grow, some of them choose not to grow, I think for all of the things that we've mentioned already in terms of how challenging it is to run a full-scale business, but for those who choose to grow, then that then brings in the additional complications of, well, where am I going to get funding for this? Most women, and I think when we think about even just access to capital, most women already are earning less than a man who has the same skill set and qualifications as they do already. In addition to that, women also then have less savings, right? For most of these micro businesses who decide to grow, a lot of the seed capital, again, because access to traditional means of funding tend to be more limited and we're not approved for small business loans at the same rate. A lot of people are not well informed about some of the grant programs and other opportunities we have. So a lot of these businesses are then funded by women borrowing against their retirement savings, right? So they are truly risking all that they have in order to grow. If we think about what's required for a business, you know, owned by a white male, right, to grow, we immediately start thinking about, oh, well, venture capital. And with venture capital, you have, you know, friends and family around seems to be the first thing to go, where people start getting money. Black and brown communities are underfunded already. And so our friends and family don't have the money to give us a couple million to, to bet on a business idea to bet on, oh, you're really good at making cakes. Let me give you all that I have to see if that's a viable, that's just not a reality in these communities. 
So there are already challenges in terms of just the community itself being underfunded. There are challenges because women don't make as much money and so their savings are not nearly as much as others in this space. Then there's just lack of business education around where to go to get funding and support in these spaces. And then even if you are so lucky as to learn how and be in some type of incubator program to learn how to pitch to venture capital, there aren't a lot of black and brown people venture capitalists. And so the people you're pitching to don't have an understanding oftentimes of the community you serve, the problem that you're trying to solve. There's just not enough representation for there to be that synergy that most of these investors are looking for before they, they decide to sign on the line and give you a lot of money. Can I, well, is there a happy ending to, to that story or is it, that, that sounds so bleak. And I guess, can I play a devil's advocate a little bit? And yeah, please. Well, one thing, I don't know if it's still true, but I'm pretty sure it might be that, uh, well, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly how to say the statistic, but because you, when you see the wealth, because wealth has become so concentrated in such a few hands and there's, there's, outliers, there's outliers like Jeff Bezos and, and stuff that command so much. But uh, so this might be a little dated, but in general, strangely, a big percentage, and I, I would, I, I know when I looked at it last, which which is dated, the majority of the wealth in America is actually controlled by women. Have you have you ever heard that? Perhaps say more about that. Well, it's just because men die younger, and oh yes, you know, so so there's a lot of older women uh. that end up holding all the money, and. And, you know, or just you look at a guy like Jeff Bezos, he's the richest man in the world. But, you know, when he gets divorced, he's got to give a big chunk of it to 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 his. So there's a lot of wealth being controlled by women. And I'm just wondering. Anyway, I want to put that in you out there that that that's something, you know, I mean, now there is obviously a whole history where the women have not been in charge of the corporate and in charge of the financial mechanisms and they've relied on the men or you know I, I have to be careful how I say this the men have controlled the money for the women even if the women own it but there's there's a big opportunity there there's an enormous opportunity there and I'm just wondering what's being done about that and that's number one and number two you know in my experience it's kind of like an older white guy I it it I, I feel like there's so many of these well, first of all, let me just say the entrepreneurial community has gone through like a, a revolution in the last 10 years or so. Like when I started out in the, in the 80s, there were none of the systems. There were, first of all, there was none of the knowledge. There was none of the, you know, you were an entrepreneur. You were really working alone with no support you were just like a pioneer doing doing stuff. Whereas now there's all you know they teach entrepreneurship in in colleges. I mean that didn't exist when, when I was in college. There's there's all this knowledge. There's all these groups. There's all all this. There, and you know the whole world of you keep talking about venture capital. I was talking at a much lower level of like angel investing, which is mm. its its own animal. And there's entire you know platforms and networks and. And they're just so hungry for, for opportunities. And I, and I think, I, I mean, I don't get the impression. Well, I get the impression that there, there's, there's just tons more divert. It's not impression. My, it's been my experience that there's just so much more diversity in, all throughout that world, like for, in the decision makers, in the people applying, in the, you know, people that are working in that field. It just seems like. There's so much potential opportunity there for everyone. And, you know, almost especially people of color and, and women, people are like, are, are looking to invest in women and people of color. This, is this, this, do you think I'm like in some kind of fantasy land or, or? Well, I think, so two things. I think one, thinking about this idea that the majority of wealth is controlled by women and then kind of citing, you know, well, cause men die and then they leave money or, men get divorced and then women get essentially like well and women are also creating it of course i mean that's that's another part of it but that's more that's more recent i mean the the thing is what I, what i'm talking about has been true for for many many decades like long before women have become now i think the majority of graduates in professional schools and stuff so so now women are actually you know generating the money themselves you know like through the system so, that, so that's that's also happening. But it, but you hear what I'm saying? This has been true for, for decades. 
so I, I'd be curious to see the numbers on that and which communities that we're actually talking about. Well, it's the communities that own wealth, which means, you know, this is White not... White communities. <laughs> so, it's the like, wealthy community we're talking about. Right. So, and so even, so even thinking about that and then thinking about, okay, opportunities for women and, and minorities, the reason that there are an abundance of opportunities for women and minorities now is because we're really trying to make up time for the lack of opportunities that there have been. And I don't think we're anywhere close to catching up. Um, so, and, and that's, I think that's just a reality. It takes a while for, for things to change to where we can actually say things are equitable. And while there are still a lot of opportunities, and I love that you're, you know, even thinking about women are more represented in advanced degree programs in terms of education. Women do tend um, to be more educated in those capacities and still with that education, women are, are still not, they don't have the earning power in terms of traditional salary sense, right, of their male peers. So in terms of this idea of then women controlling most of the, the wealth, I think there's, there seems to be maybe a schism in, in the data a little bit around exactly which populations that we're, we're actually referring to. Well, what I'm saying is uh, there's this like, it feels like there's like this untapped gold mine controlled by wealthy women that is a huge opportunity. And there's all these, I'm sure, institutional barriers to getting it, mm -hmm. as well as racial and other barriers. But right. it's there. And, yeah. you know, like, uh, you know, just like when you think of the wealthiest brand names, I mean, what's her name? Steve Jobs' widow and, you know, Melinda, Bill and Melinda Gates. I mean, it, there's, there's huge amounts of money that, that 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 the that that the women have 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 either complete control over or partial control over, and I don't know. I don't know. So is, is your suggestion that all the wealthy women create some type of grant funding program for small business owners? Well, what, what I'm saying is, there there there's an ask there to be made. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to come from the wealthy women. I think it's going to come right. from the women that need the money, asking the wealthy women and and saying you know, black women, whatever the Black Lives Matter equivalent uh, statement would be for, come on, ladies, time to invest in us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think there there is something to that. I think, but kind of going back to our earlier conversation, that, that would require all of those entrepreneurs to, to presume themselves worthy of that in the first place. Yeah. So, sure. and... And also it takes, <laughs> on a, it, you know, in the fundraising world, it's called moves management. Have you heard mm -hmm. that? You know, it's like... It's like, okay, I'm here, wherever, in Brooklyn or Harlem or wherever I'm living. How do I get to, to, the, to that yeah. person there? And, and it's, it's, it's that's, a, that's a science. That's, or not a science, but there's a real art to that. And, but it, it can, if you get, set your mind to it, it can happen. It feels to me like it's, it's going to happen. I mean, it's go I know it's going to happen, but I don't know how long it's going to take. Right. Well, it's interesting because the world is definitely getting smaller. And I think the yeah. power of, of networking is what kind of gives us access to new resources in that way. And so much of that work has to be done intentionally. Yeah. Uh, you know, and again, as you said, like there's a lot that goes into entrepreneurship. I think networking and expanding your network and building those relationships is a huge part of it. And I think for a lot of entrepreneurs, that's still a huge growth area. Well, and also in terms of, of leadership, you know, what you were saying was a lot of the people you work with are thinking, maybe are not thinking, are thinking small. The, the, mm -hmm. the, the, you never even once said the word scale, like how, how do we scale? I mean, and, and it's possible that a lot of your clients aren't at that point yet where that's the issue is what, how do we scale? Because once you get to that question, it's all about investment. Yeah. It's all about where do I find the, the investors? You know, once you've proven that you've got a, something that works, it's all, I mean, that's, this is the capitalist model. And maybe that's not the future that you, you're pushing for, but that's, <laughs> that's the world that we, you know, that's the world that controls us right now. Oh, interesting choice of words, Ben. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. I think that's the world that we choose to live in for the moment. Oh, if it's it's completely a choice, there are definitely choices in it, but there's some of those choices are limited by the system. Mm, no? I think I I think that's somewhat somewhat debatable. 
for most people, the thing that they want isn't money, it's the thing that money affords them. And so I still think that there's room to, to bypass money in a lot of situations in order for us to get our needs met. Money is just a tool. It's a very popular tool, but it's not the only one. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, but uh, yeah, <laughs> entrepreneurship is not easy. And yeah. there's, always, there's always learning and growing to be done. And the work you're doing is amazing. I'm so inspired by, by what, the things you've told us. Any, any other, well, tell, how do people get in touch with you and what, what kind of, tell us a little bit about the programs that you're offering and, and who they're for and how people can make use of them. Yeah. So for entrepreneurs in transition, I do a group program and I also do um, one-on-one coaching for black and brown women who are looking to jump into entrepreneurship, who have that, you know, that side hustle bug and they're trying, trying to really grow it and establish it. And I do the group program starts, there's one that starts in September and another that I do in the spring. And for either of those, you can reach out to me directly on uh, my website, mariedevoe.com, or I strongly encourage messages via LinkedIn, <laughs> which is also Marie DeVoe. And then for corporations who are looking to do more inclusive leadership work, again, can reach out to me uh, on my website and, and it's we can have e- conversations e- about that. It's DeVoe, D-E-V-E-A-U-X. Yes. And Marie, M-A-R-I-E, because this is a podcast, so I don't know whether people will see things written anywhere. Oh, well, you got to put it in the show notes, Ben. Well, it'll be in the show notes, but <laughs> I, I don't I don't know. People might just listen to things. <laughs> that's true. Good point. Well, that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for spending an hour with me. And what you had to say was fascinating. And let me know how I can support you because I, I, I think what you're doing is amazing. Well, thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. All right. Till, till we meet again. All right. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. You too. All right. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Nature Breakthroughs podcast with Dr. Wild Ben Goldman to discover what you need for personal, organizational, and societal change. Get your free download of Three Ancient Rituals Smart Entrepreneurs Use to Bounce Back from Shifts in the Market and Inside Themselves. Go to www dot naturebreakthroughs dot com